We'll turn your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 5. 2 Chronicles chapter 5. My subject tonight, Attracting God's Glory. There are steps that you must take if you want to attract God's glory. And I'm going to talk about those steps tonight. See, God is the source of glory. He is the Lord of glory. And when his glory shows up, miracles happen. So I want to attract God's glory. That's been my quest ever since I got saved. Like Paul, Paul said that I may know him. And, and Paul later, at the end of his journey in 2 Timothy, the last book he wrote, he said, for I know whom I have believed. He said, I, I know him now. And I believe that should be the quest of every Christian's heart to get to know the Lord just a little bit better. And there are steps that you take that will attract God's glory. Second Chronicles 5 and 11. I want to look at this uh, group of scriptures here. And I want to look at how they attracted God's glory. The steps they took. And if they took steps and it worked for them. And, and that's Old Testament. And God said in the last days I'm going to pour out the former rain and the latter rain in the same season. If we take these steps, guess what? We should attract God's glory. 2 Chronicles 5 and 11. And it came to pass when the priests would come out of the holy place, the holy place, for all the priests were present. They were sanctified. You say all the priests were sanctified. Isn't that beautiful? And did not wait by course. Also, the Levites, which were the singers, all of them of Asaph, of Heman, of J. J. Dudon, with the sons and brothers being arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psalters and harps, stood at the end of the altar, and with them an hundred and twenty priests sounding the trumpets. Hundred and twenty priests with trumpets. Verse 13 says, It came to pass as the trumpeters and the singers were as one. Do you see that? That's a key. They were as one. As one to make one sound to being heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voices with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endure it forever. That the house was filled with the cloud, even the house of the Lord. Something has happened to my monitors, David. They are turned up louder than they were, and I'm getting an echo up here. I want you to notice that the singers, they were singing and praising God and worshiping God with all they had. In other words, it was coming from their heart. It was coming from their heart. Now, what in the world has happened to the church? Now, I'm not talking about this church. I'm talking about the churches in general because this is a praising church. But we go and we visit other people and we know that that's not the case at other places. And the church has lost its shout, it's lost its dance, it's lost its enthusiasm. And a lot of people in this church, guess what? They have lost their enthusiasm. If they hadn't, they would be back in the house of God. Our culture has taught us that it's the Lord's day, Lord's hour, but no, it's the Lord's day. And I know people don't like to hear me preach yet, but I'll preach it till I drop. Because it's right in line with this book. Hallelujah. And some people will stand eternal rebuke before God because they have treated his day wrongly. And they will not get the blessings in life that they could have simply because they think Jesus is a Sunday morning Jesus. Jesus is not a Sunday morning Jesus. He's a Jesus that goes with you everywhere. That, that's why God wanted to put his glory inside of us. Wherever we go, his glory goes we are carriers of God's glory but there are certain things that if you're going to attract God's glory and maintain that in your life as a lifestyle then you will have to follow these things that are found right here in this verse of scriptures somehow the body of Christ thinks it's fanatical when you get radical in your praise I didn't know that was gonna rhyme Lord they think it's fanatical they think it's fanaticism when you really get radical and you start praising God. But the people that we read about, they lifted up their voices with the trumpet and the cymbals and the instruments of music. 
And they praised the Lord and they were saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. And when they did, the temple was filled with a cloud. Now look at verse 14. The temple was filled with a cloud so that the priests could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house. Brother Philip, he's excited about this one because we pray all the time, Lord, we want to see the glory. We, we actually want to see the glory cloud. Now, I know, I know we have the Holy Ghost and we're full of glory, but at the same time, I want to see God show up in such manifest presence that the cloud of his glory fills the house. It's all right to ask the Lord, you know. If he did it once, praise God, he can do it again. Amen. He did it for them. He can certainly do it for us. And, and there have been people that have seen the glory. Amen. I, I saw the glory. I was taken out of my body one Sunday morning. And I saw the brightest light I've ever seen in my life. And when I came back, you know, two ladies in the church said, I wonder if the pastor saw that glory that was around him. That was a cloud of glory. I told my wife, I said, I didn't just see it. I did everything but look in the face of Jesus. And God healed me. That's what the glory will do. I want to talk to you about attracting God's glory. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for your presence. Thank you, Lord, for filling us with your glory. Thank you, Lord, that it was what you had planned from the beginning to make us your tabernacle, to come and walk in us and dwell in us, to live in us. And wherever we go, that we could carry your glory. Lord, fill us again and again and again. And let us, oh God, have a heart that searches for you. Lord, a heart that longs for the glory. Show us your glory. And everyone said in Jesus' name, amen. amen. The Shekinah, the glory of God, filled that Old Testament tabernacle. It was the visible representation of the presence of God. The cloud was the robe in which the glory was wrapped. Now God wraps us in that cloud of glory. The visible presence of God was so strong that the priests, they could not even stand to minister. They were evidently slain. Doesn't say that, but if they couldn't stand up, they had to fall down, amen? People don't understand Pentecost. It's, it's a phenomenon. But the glory of God is the miracle working power of God. It is the presence of God. It is his majesty, his splendor, his power, his might, his love. But whatever the manifestation, the glory of God should always produce praise. I'll say that again. Whatever the manifestation, the glory of God, the presence of God, the miracle working power of God should always produce praise in our hearts. And if you want to attract God's glory in your own life, there are some things that you must do. See, we can learn how to attract God's glory by looking at some key elements in this text that I read. Solomon had finished building the temple. There had been years of preparation, and now he is ready to see the cloud, the house rather, fill with God's glory. The temple was ready. It was complete, but there was one thing that was missing. They had built it. It was ready. They wanted to go in and worship, but one thing was missing. It had not been filled with the presence and the glory of God. And Solomon knew that you can't just wait and want and for the glory to show up. You can't just wait. You just can't sit back and wait and say, well, I just hope when I go to church tonight, the glory will show up. We pray. We seek God. And we just keep on doing it because we know that God is going to show up in great power because of what the scriptures say. Amen. But Solomon knew that you couldn't just wish for it. He knew that there are some things that you have to do because nothing comes down until something goes up. Nothing comes down until something goes up. I'll say that again. Nothing will ever come down in your life until something goes up. 
You got to send up some prayers. You got to send up some praise. You got to send up some worship. You got to send God a sacrifice. Nothing ever comes down until something goes up. Amen. And there are five things in this text that we must do that I found, maybe more than five, if we're going to attract God's glory. And if, if we can get these things activated in the church, I believe that God's glory will show up like we have never experienced it before. Now, we have good times in the Lord, but I want to see it like I've never seen it before. How about you? I mean, I want to see it. Go on, praise God. I, I want to see the visible glory. I, I know he's in us, and I can see his glory in you, but I want to see the visible Shekinah glory of God show up in the house. See, and if, if, if we can get these things activated in the church, it will show up. Your body is the temple of God. And to attract his glory, there are things, some things that are necessary. And there are some things that must take place in your life personally, in my life personally, and then in the corporate body of Christ. First of all, what will attract God's glory? Holy living will attract God's glory. Look at verse 11, 2 Chronicles 5 and 11. It came to pass when the priests would come out of the holy place, for all the priests that were present were sanctified. All of those priests were sanctified. Have you been sanctified? Have you laid aside all the weights, all the things that are keeping you from entering to what God has purposed for your life? See, God's glory filled the temple when all the priests were sanctified. Now, well, you say, well, that's the preacher. The preacher ought to be sanctified. Well, let me help you a little bit. See, when all the priests got sanctified, that brought the glory. But you and I, we need to understand this. You and I, we are all priests unto God. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. We are a peculiar people. And he said we should show forth the praises of him that called us out of darkness into the marvelous light. So if we are a royal priesthood and a holy nation, then for God to show up in our services, we all need to live a holy, sanctified life. The word sanctifies. The word will wash you. The word will cleanse you. Well, what does that word mean, Pastor, to sanctify? It means to set something apart for God's purpose. It means that we are different. It means that there is a notable difference in our lives, in our lifestyle, in our conversation, in the way we live. We're just not like the rest of the world. We're different. We've been hewed out of the chief cornerstone, Christ Jesus. We're lively stone. I mean, we just get lively sometimes. We just start praising God. Because it's our nature to. Because we're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And then God says, I want you to show forth some praises. And you can't think of praise. People sit in church and they never open their mouth. I'm going to say it till I die. You can't think of praise. You got to open your mouth and say, praise the Lord. Glory. It do some of you some good just to open your mouth and, and start praising God. It would shock you that he would show up. In your presence, hallelujah. God inhabits the praises of his people. God does not inhabit murmuring and grumbling and griping and complaining. The devil inhabits that. Just well to go and preach it. The devil will show up. He's attracted to stuff like that. God is attracted to thanksgiving and praise and worship and glories and hallelujahs. I tell you, that'll attract God. His glory will show up in your life when you start praising him hallelujah see we have been redeemed we have renounced the unfruitful works of darkness we're, we're peculiar i mean we live in a, a generation they think we're crazy i mean what in the world are you doing sitting in church on sunday night and what are you doing going on sunday morning they they all the world's out there with their hangovers and wondering what in the world did i do last night and, and they can't understand you giving a tenth of everything God gives to you to him and then, then turning around and giving offerings and 
They don't understand that. And, and, and I'm, I'm about to get like old brother Jensen. He said, I don't want a Christian telling, a sinner telling me what a Christian should do. People live like the devil and they want to judge you for your holy living. And when you don't measure up because you just can't get there sometimes, you know, they want to criticize you. Well, Jesus couldn't get there all the time either. He was in a body. And that's why he, he went back to heaven and sent the Holy Ghost so we could get there. The church could get there as a body. But people are judging. I don't want a sinner judging me. They need to go to Calvary, get on their knees, and repent of their sins. And that's not harsh. That's just good preaching. Amen. Hallelujah. We're different. We have said, I don't want that lifestyle anymore. I'm through with sin. I'm not going to flirt with it. I'm not going to live with one foot in the church and one foot in the world. There's something that's changed in my life. There's been a change in his life for mine since the Lord laid his hand on me. And I'm like old brother David. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I've experienced God's glory, and I'm going to do everything I can to retain it. I'm going to do everything I can to attract it. Hallelujah. I've been sanctified. I've been set apart, and I've been set apart for God's glory. Go on and praise him. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You know, it's something wonderful when God sets you apart and sanctifies you. And this is a message that the body of Christ needs to hear today. You know, it, it, it's alarming, and I'm alarmed at how many people go back and pick up their old habits. Picking up those cigarettes again. Amen. Just well to preach it. Hanging out with that wrong crowd. Going back to the clubs again. And we got grandmothers and grandpas going back to the clubs. Wonder what they're going to think they're going to find there that wasn't at the club when they were in the world. Amen. You're not going to find God in the club. Now, he'll go in the club and save somebody. But if you go into the club, let me tell you what you're going to find. You're going to find a cesspool of sin and iniquity. How in the world you know that, Pastor? Because before I got redeemed, I used to visit the clubs. <laughs> I don't go there anymore. Have no desire. Don't want to smell that stinking cigarettes. Don't want to smell that liquor. Don't want to smell that beer. Don't, don't want somebody drunk hanging all off of me. God, I'll help them, but God help me, I don't want to go there. And the only time I intend to go there is to pull somebody out of it, tell them about Jesus, that God will sanctify them holy and set them apart. And, and it's time for the church to sanctify herself. We're living like the world. God said, come out from among them. Be ye holy. You were sometimes in darkness, but now you children of light. Walk as children of light. I mean, that's the way he expects me to walk. That's the way he expects me to talk. Things I used to do, I don't do no more since the Lord made a change in me. Place I used to go, the things I used to do, the way I used to talk, the way I used to walk, I don't do that anymore. Why? There's been a change in this life of mine since the Lord laid his hand on me. I thought I could never live it. That's the lie the devil told me all my life, but guess what? He lives it through me. I have no desire to go back. I say, God, I'm like old brother Paul. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm climbing every day. Still praying as I onward man. Lord, plant my feet on high ground. Lord, I just want to see the glory. I have one desire in my heart, Lord, is to see the glory. Lord, I have a desire to see families and homes and lives changed and little children coming into the church and raising up their hands and shouting glory to God in the highest peace on earth goodwill toward men hallelujah see that should be a check in our spirit when, when things of the world don't bother us cursing again loose conversation again going back to those old world worldly ways I'm telling you church I need and you need, we all need to live a sanctified life. And the word of God will sanctify you. I'm, I'm not just talking about listening to me preach. Now, like I said earlier, 
I'm beginning to wonder if uh, some people don't like my preaching. They wander up and down the halls. They wander all over the church. They don't come into church. They, you know, I've asked them, will you please come into the sanctuary? I, I, I just wonder if it's, is it my preaching. Well, uh, I don't think it is because I said, well, I'm going to find out. And I start bringing other preachers in. And guess what? They do the same way. And, and, and they're not attracting God's glory. They're headed for a fall. And they don't understand that. And God puts a pastor up, said, I'll give you pastors according to my heart. And I try to be nice. I really do. But I still got to preach the word of God with love. I got to bring correction. You know, God will correct us. You know what? If I don't bring it with the word of God and people don't heed it, you know what God will do? He'll whip them. He will whip them. I guarantee you he'll whip them. Because he said he would. Well, let's get back to this. Hallelujah. Let's talk about the glory. But, you know, I'm not talking about just coming to hear me preach, though. I'm talking about being sanctified by picking up the Bible and reading the book. We ought to pick this book up, and we ought to read it. Amen. Because literally, as you read the Bible, it washes you. It sanctifies you. It sets you apart by the renewing of your mind. Our minds must be renewed. Look at it at Romans 12 and 2. God said, be not conformed to this world. Now, do you think the church is conformed to the world? Most of the church? Unfortunately, they are. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. They have three wheels right there. That's a good will, that's an acceptable will, and that's a perfect will. Well, I decided a long time ago I want to walk as perfectly as possible. Then I fought, found out that Jesus is my perfection. So I found out with all my flaws and shortcomings, guess what? Jesus has perfected me. Jesus has perfected you. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, he has perfected forever those that are sanctified. Those that have set themselves apart. Uh, he, he was made sin with our sins so we could be made the righteousness of God. He's our righteousness and he's our perfection. And, and that's the position he has put us in as a child of God. Now, perfection doesn't mean that you don't sin. You know, Job was perfect, yet he had to repent. David, the Bible says he was perfect. A man after God's own heart, yet he had to repent. Said Asa was perfect, King Asa, yet he had to repent. All through the Bible we find people that their perfection was not the fact they were sinless. It was their total submission to God. That is perfection. Because when you totally submit to God, you're saying, God, I'm allowing you to set me apart for whatever you have chosen for my life. And that's when you really start living in victory. But if you don't get your mind transformed by the word of God, then you will be conformed to the world. You will go back. If you get saved and you don't renew your mind with the word of God, you will find yourself on a drift going back to what you used to be. That's why the word of God is so important. That's why coming back to church and getting the spirit, spirit man fed is so important. Amen. Because if you don't, you'll go back. That's why I encourage people to read the Bible through. That's why we give out those calendars every year. I'm challenging people to get back to the book, back to the Bible. Hallelujah. Because a lot of the Bible battles that people are losing, guess what? They wouldn't lose if they would pick up this book and read it. If some people would, would pick this book up and, I mean, apply it. Don't just be a hearer, hear, be a doer. If you pick this book up and do what it says, you'd get your fight back. You'd get your anointing back. You'd get God's presence back. And you'd get all of that if you just start reading the book. Hallelujah. And read it and say, God, I am going to apply those principles in my life. It does you no good to read it. If you're not going to do it. A lot of people that are hearers. You know. Sometimes you don't need to listen to a CD. Sometimes you don't need to listen to my preaching. 
Sometimes you just need to go straight to the source, pick up the book, and start reading. Say, God, what have you got to say to me? I, I don't mean sometimes. I mean you need to do that every day. Every day of your life, you need to open this book. You need to read its pages, and you need to be sanctified, set apart by the word of God. It's called the washing of the water of the word. In the Old Testament, there were a lot of tents. See, God set things apart for him. He wants to set us apart for his own use. There were a lot of tents in the Old Testament, but there was one tent that God said, this tent is set apart for my purpose. It was sanctified. He said, that tent will be the tent where my presence and my glory will show up. Do you want his glory to show up in your life? I believe you do. There were a lot of altars, but God says that one altar, that altar right there, that altar is going to be set apart for my altar. There were a lot of tables, a lot of candlesticks, but God says those right there, they're for me. Hallelujah. There were a lot of lambs, a lot of bullocks, ten thousands of them, but there were certain ones, the pure ones, the unblemished ones. They were to be set apart for God's use. There were days that he set apart, such as the Sabbath, and it's still set apart. We just happen to worship on the Lord's day now and not on Saturday, the Sabbath. That was the day of atonement. God had special days. That was the tithe. The tithe was set apart from the rest of the money. Why was it set apart, Pastor? The Bible says it was holy unto the Lord. It was sanctified and, and the tithe actually was a way of sanctifying your money. See, if your money is not sanctified, and if you're not tithing, then you're missing what God has purposed for your life. Because when you set it apart, it's all sanctified, the whole 100%. But, but if you don't tithe it and set apart that portion to God, guess what? Your monies are not sanctified. It was sanctified, and the tithe... It, it has a reason for it. It's to sanctify it and make it holy, but it's also because God has a seed time, harvest time principle. And, and that's God's economy. And God says, hey, you got enough faith to trust me? I, I can take that 90% because I'm the Lord of the harvest. And I can make it go much further than that 100% in your hand. God said, it's holy to me, just like that altar is holy. Just like that day is holy. Just like God had uh, certain things, tents and altars and tables and candlesticks. It was all holy to him. And, and the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. And that means that every evil that can be manifest through money will be manifest through your money if it's not sanctified. Every evil thing that could come from money the love of it is the root of all evil it means that that evil can show up in your life because you fail to sanctify your money a lot of people don't like preaching like this but you know sometimes we just need to look at what the Bible says and we need to say hey am I doing that God told me when I got saved I said God what's wrong with my life he said son you've sown bad seed you got a bad harvest he got my attention real good and I started trying to do what the Bible says. But if your money is not sanctified, then, you know, it can be used for some evil things. That's why he said, set apart 10% of it, and I will sanctify it. And then God said, I'll bless the rest. It's holy. And if you take it and do unholy things with it, like not giving it to God and consuming it on your own lust, guess what? God says it's not sanctified. And he will let the devourer come in. And if you don't believe that, go read Malachi 3 and 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that thou may meet in my house and prove me now. He will say, the Lord God of hosts, if I will not open up the windows of heaven, pour you out a blessing, there will not be room enough to receive it. He said, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Now, that devourer is coming. Jesus said the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy but I'm coming that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And if your money is not sanctified, guess what the, the devourer is going to do? 
He's going to gobble it up here, gobble a little there, and just keep on gobbling it. And you could lose it all. Well, hallelujah. Sanctify your money. Amen. <laughs> this building is sanctified. This building right here that we are standing and sitting in it is sanctified for one purpose. It is to provide a place for God's people and for sinners to come and experience the presence of God. This is a sanctified building. How do you know it? Because the whole time we were working on it, I was praying on it. I had prayer teams out here. I'd call me and I'd say, come on out here. Help me pray over this building. And then we had it dedicated by the top man in the conference. Our bishop came to dedicate it to the Lord. Sanctified. Hallelujah. We set it apart, you know, for God's glory. Holy living will attract God's glory. Look at this scripture in the Old Testament, Exodus 19 and 5. This is powerful. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all the people, for all the earth is mine. Now, God says, if you will obey me and what I've told you to do, you will be peculiar. Now, we are a chosen generation, a peculiar people, a royal priest. It goes right on from the Old Testament right into the New. That God says, you will be, look at that. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, everything, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me. Wow. Above all the people. For all the earth is mine. A special people. That's what God is looking for. Uh, put First Peter 2 and 9 up there. Because this, this Old Testament scripture goes right on into the New Testament. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. That's that we're talking about holiness. A peculiar people. That you should show forth the praises of him that called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. See, God has purified each and every one of us unto himself as a peculiar people through the precious blood of Jesus. We are different. We're not like the world. And, and if you like the world, you need to come to Calvary. You need to go back down and dip in the blood one more time. If I get worldly minded and get like the world, guess what? I need to come back to Calvary. If we want the glory of God, we must get our sensitivity back to the things that grieve God's spirit. We must live a sanctified, holy, pure life. That things that grieve the spirit of God. When we fail to show the love we should show in relationship, it grieves God. When we fail to forgive those that have wronged us, it grieves God. When we hold grudges and, and have old mindsets and we just refuse to change when God is changing, it grieves God. See, God never changes, yet he expects us to change and to be relevant. And that's some beautiful truths that are found in this Old Testament story in Second Chronicles chapter 5. But not only will ho uh, holy living bring God's glory, prayer. Secondly, prayer will attract God's glory. Hallelujah. Man, that, that looks nice, doesn't it? Right there in New York City. Hallelujah. I'd like to be preaching right up there, right about now, with a microphone, the whole square, Times Square, filled with people. Amen. Hallelujah. L listen to what Solomon prayed when he dedicated the temple, Second Chronicles 6 and 40. Now, my God, let I beseech thee, thine eyes be open, and let thine ears be attent unto the prayer that is made in this place. Wow. Do you want God's presence in your life? Then you've got to pray. Now, most Christians pray some, but I don't believe that very many of God's people pray like they should. Most of God's people, they, they don't read the Bible. They don't seek God. They don't pray. How can you know that, Pastor? Well, if God's people were praying people, this church would be filled during seasons of prayer. I call 
prayer meetings all the time. And, and if people were really seeking God, guess what? They would be at the prayer meeting. Well, I pray at home, Pastor. Yeah, over your food. Some of you forget to do that. I watch people in restaurants. I watch Christians. And, I, and I've started eating at times, and I've said, God, please forgive me for eating your food without thanking you for it. Even when I was a sinner, you know, I, I, can, I can remember I'd sit there at the table with, with sinners, and I was a sinner. And I'd bow my head, and I'd do like I was scratching my head. And I said, oh, God, I pray that you'll sanctify this food to the strength and nourishment of my body. <laughs> I'd pray my daddy's prayer. You know, we didn't eat at our house without thanking God for the food. And, and I guess it was just taking it. It didn't take it a long time to take, but it was taking effect on me anyway. But I, I'd pretend like, you know, man, it's hot. <laughs> I can remember being out on patrol, and I'd take my helmet off, and I'd do like that, and we'd be eating our sea rations. I'd be thanking God for my sea rations, you know. Bring up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he shall not depart from it. Don't worry about him. You just teach him. You just train him. And God will take care of the rest. Hallelujah. You know, if we would pray and read our Bibles and seek God's face, you'd be amazed at how strong God's presence would be in this place. We just get everybody. So I encourage you to pray every day. You know, I thought about it. The first thing you should do when you wake up is pray. Pray in the shower. Pray when you're getting dressed. Pray when you walk, pray when you jog, pray when you work out, pray in your car, pray when you get to work. Talk to the Lord and, and invite God in everything that you do. Jesus said, pray without ceasing. I'm preaching good now. I said, pray all the time. Jesus said, pray without ceasing. It's prayer that invites God's glory into the temple. I said, it's prayer. Prayer. And a great prayer movement is starting. I see it. I, I can get preachers to come and pray that years ago, they wouldn't even listen to me. And now they're starting to come. God is moving. Amen. See, we need to develop our prayer life and learn to call upon the Lord. And don't wait for an emergency before you pray. I love this right here. Store up some prayers. Amen. Become a prayer warrior. And when the battles of life come, you will be able to stand and see the salvation of the Lord. Store up some prayers. And God gave me this straight, straight from heaven this afternoon when I was looking, looking over this. He said, store up some prayers. He said, and before you call, I will answer. And he will say, here I am. And though you have stored up those prayers, and when you step into a situation because you have been praying, and you suited up, and you prayed up, and you praised up, and you worshiped God. God says, ha, ah, I see a heart that's after me. And God says, you won't even have to call. He said, I've heard your prayers. I've seen you in that prayer chamber. I've heard you crying out for the harvest. I've heard you crying out for revival. I've heard you asking me and seeking me. You don't even have to ask for this one. Boom. There it is. Store up some prayers. Hallelujah. But not only does holiness and prayer attract God's glory, thirdly, worship will attract God's glory. Now, you know, worship is, is something that we do from our heart. You know, a drunk can praise the Lord, but worship, worship is something that comes from the heart. Worship is a lifestyle. Look at 2 Chronicles 5.13. It came even to pass as the trumpeters and the singers were as one, as that one again, were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpet and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For the Lord is good, for his mercy endureth forever, that then the house was filled with the cloud, even the house of the Lord. Verse 14, so that the priests could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house. They began to sing. Back then, that Old Testament that Solomon had built. They began to praise God. 
The 120 priests, they were blowing trumpets. The people were singing, and they became as one, and they were worshiping God. Do you remember Gideon? And, and Gideon, God got him down to the three, 300 men, and he says, when the enemies come out of that tent, he says, stand as one. Say, when, when I blow my trumpet, I want you to blow yours. When I break my pitcher, you break your pitcher. And, and, and they stood as one, and when they broke that pitcher, the light flared, boom. The enemy came out, and they were so confused that they killed one another. <laughs> they stood as one. You know, on the day of Pentecost, they were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly, the glory showed up. Hallelujah. They began to sing and praise God. There must be a, restora a, a restoration of spiritual worship in the body of Christ if we're going to attract God's glory. There must be a restoration of worship. I'm not talking about loud noises. I'm talking about worship that comes out of your heart. That's why, you, you know, I could hear the Spirit saying to me, sing it again. Sing that part again. Took my sins and my sorrows. Glory to God. I mean, if that doesn't excite you, if, if that doesn't cause tears to start trickling down your face, something's wrong with you. You need to pray and pray and pray and pray and pray until you get back to where you need to be. See, worship will attract the deeper things of God, the presence of God, and the miracle-working power of God. They weren't just making noise. They dedicated that temple. They were with one purpose. They were singing. They were praising. They were lifting their voice to God, and it was coming from their heart. Now, we, we got a lot of singing that, you know, and, and I'm real concerned uh, about the upcoming generation because I, I go to their stuff, and a lot of it's loud noise. It is. It's just loud noise and because you can't worship God if you're out in the back seat of an automobile having sexual intercourse as soon as you get out of church. That ain't worship, my friends. And, and you and I, we can't worship God if we got somebody waiting on the side, not with just the young people, but this, that generation, they think because of our culture. Church, we got a great work to do right now. They think because of our culture and, and the things that are promiscuous, uh, permissiveness that's in our culture that they can live like that but I'm going to tell you the culture doesn't set the standard the word of God sets the standard and and, and we got people in this nation uh, you, you know I mean good Christians they say well you know it'd be all right for the the uh, homosexuals and the lesbians to live together as long as they don't force it no it won't God said it's an abomination it will always be an abomination. It, that won't be any more right than, than me going out and committing adultery. Or one of these young men that's not married going out and committing fornication. They're all sexual sins. But, you know, that one is so bad that God said they've left the natural use. He said that's an abomination. And if God says an abomination, I don't care what the United States government tries to say about it. They're wrong, wrong, wrong. And God is right, right, right. And people say, well, you just don't love the way you should. Yes, I do. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And I'd rather preach the truth to them and see them make heaven their eternal home than believe a lie and be damned and go to a devil's hell for all eternity. We got to touch this generation. That's why we need to attract God's glory. Amen. We, 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 we've lost generations. We just haven't. Touch them with the power of God. There's something about heartfelt worship that attracts God's glory. So learn how to worship from your heart. Which brings me to my fourth point. Sacrifice will attract God's glory. When you approach God with a sacrifice, he knows you're serious. When you bring a sacrifice, it might just be bringing yourself. I mean, he might not feel like coming. But if you just bring yourself and say, God, I'm bringing a living sacrifice. I'm doing the best I can do, God. And I'm giving it all to you. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. 
So learn to, to worship God with a sacrifice. Give God something that is important to you. Because the greater your sacrifice, the greater your blessing. Give him something that means something to you. Give it to him. And say, God, I'm giving you this sacrifice. This is important to me. And, and the greater my sacrifice, the greater the blessing. See, give God a sacrifice because your sacrifice activates the favor of God. Thank you for being here tonight. Keep a sacrifice on the altar and God will fight your battles for you. Keep it on the altar. Always. When Pharaoh finally let God's people go, he said, leave all the cattle behind. Well, the cattle was what they used to sacrifice and worship God with. And Moses said, we're going, but we will not leave one hoof behind. Moses knew that they must have a sacrifice. And if you're going to worship God, if you're going to activate God's favor, you must have a sacrifice. Listen to me. If you don't have a sacrifice and if you don't worship, you will lose your intensity. And you will be living on yesterday's blessings. If you don't worship God, if you don't live with passion, you will lose your intensity. You will be living on yesterday's blessings. And heaven's bakery is always open. And you don't have to live on stale manna. You can have fresh bread right from heaven. God's still making highways. It's called Highway Isaiah chapter 35, the highway of holiness. Hallelujah. God's bakery is open, and you can get it. Job, you know, the first thing that the devil attacked in Job's life was the animals. Every day he would get up, and for those children... Man, this is powerful. Keep your, yourself on the altar for your children. Job would sacrifice every day of his life. He said, I don't know if my children are living right or if they're living wrong. And he would take and place a sacrifice on the altar. Put yourself on the altar and say, hey, devil, I got a sacrifice on God's altar. You're not having my children. Get your hands off of my children. Get your hands off of my finances. Get your hands off of my home. Devil, I'm on the altar. God loves a sacrifice, and I'm giving him everything. Hallelujah. Don't let the devil take your sacrifice, because if that happens, it won't be long before that old lifestyle will recapture you. Amen. See, the key to deliverance and the key to victory is you have got to have a sacrifice of worship. It doesn't matter how bad things are. It doesn't matter how much you have failed. It doesn't matter how much you have messed up. If you will repent and worship God with a sacrifice, God will always take you back. Learn to sacrifice and learn to worship God. And if you think you're losing God, grand worship anyway because the devil wants to steal your sacrifice. Don't lose your sacrifice. The worship experience begins when you put a sacrifice on the altar. And then the fire fell and consumed it. Amen. That's, that's the pattern. In that Old Testament, they would put a sacrifice on the altar. Elijah goes up and he puts it there and calls down fire from heaven. The fire fell. He had a sacrifice there. Amen. But think about this. What about all the preparation? Somebody had to prepare those Old Testament sacrifices. They had to chase that goat down. Somebody had to pull, pluck those dove feathers. Somebody had to slaughter those animals. They didn't just come in and say, I hope God shows up. It was the preparation. They made major preparation for worship. Have you ever prepared your heart for worship before you came to church? Have you ever just prayed and said, Lord, when I get there, I want my heart prepared? You know, we have those occasions at time. I don't know how God gets us all in one accord like that. But sometimes I think we've all, the Spirit of God must have just talked to us individually. And we come in and from the first note is hit, all of a sudden, boom, we're there. And we're worshiping God. Amen.
prepare your heart. See, it took them hours to prepare for just one sacrifice. What if the church prayed and sought God all week long and says, I'm going to the house of God. And when the church doors open, I'm going to show up with my praise and my glories and my hallelujahs. Hallelujah. And pretty soon, you know, his glory will fill the temple. So we know that holy living, prayer, worship, and a sacrifice brings God's glory. Lastly, I want to show you something that will really bring God's glory. I preached it for years. I've always talked about love, faith, and unity. Unity, point number five, will attract God's glory. Matter of fact, uh, put Psalms uh, 133 up, verse 1, 2, 3. We'll just read it all because I'm going to end with this. I'm going to show you what a sacrifice and what unity, rather, will do. And, and your sacrifice. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Verse 2. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garments. Don't move yet. Leave it right there. It will go verse 3. Aaron was the high priest. And I want you to notice where the oil started. It started in the pulpit. You need to get a better idea about the preacher, some of you do. It starts in the pulpit. I see preachers done all kind of ways. Y'all been good to me. I can promise you that. But I, I see preachers done really badly. It's the nicest way I can see it. Go back to that verse 1. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren, the church, to prefer one another above themselves. Why do we do that? To dwell together in unity. Now go on to the next verse, please. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down the skirts of his garment. It started at the head, his beard. God poured the oil on him and ran down his body. We're the body of Christ, aren't we? So suppose it started Jesus, the head, to the pastor, the local head of the church, down the body. Now look at the, the verse, next verse. This is why the devil fights unity so much. He'll fight it in your home. He'll fight it in your marriage. He'll fight it in your family. He'll fight it in your church. He does not want unity. Because look at this. As the dew of Hebron, the mountain, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, that, that oil is like that, refreshing like the dew that comes down on the mountaintops. For there, where? At the place of unity. You got to go back to verse 1. For there, at the place of unity, the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. In other words, when we get the church together in unity, God commands the blessing on the church and even life forevermore. Sinners coming into the church because of the anointing that is flowing down from the pulpit to the pews. The pews are in unity with the pulpit, and the pulpit's in unity the pews are praising God. They're pulling the preach out of the preacher. And they're flowing together in unity and love and faith. And all of a sudden, the power and the glory of God shows up. And guess what? Sinners are convicted. And they come running to the altar to get saved. Because the same spirit that blesses the saint is the same spirit that convicts the sinner. And they come and say, oh, my God. God has commanded the blessing upon the house. God has commanded the blessing upon the harvest because the church is working together and flowing together in unity. According to this text, the people, they became as one. 
When the church becomes as one, the trumpets and the singers, they was one. When the family becomes as one, when a marriage becomes as one, unity will attract the glory of God. If, if we've learned anything out of this lesson, that's what we should see. Holy living, prayer, worship, sacrifice, and unity, they all bring the glory of God. They bring it into your home. They bring it into the church. The musicians became as one. The singers became as one. The people became as one. It wasn't just a bunch of music up there and everybody doing their own thing. No, they came together as one. And God commanded the blessing. I'm going to read my text one time and I'm going to be through. Look at it. 2 Chronicles 5, 13 and following. It came even to pass as the trumpeters and the singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking God when they all lifted up their voice with the trumpet and the cymbals and the instruments of music and praised the Lord saying, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. They became as one. Then the house was filled with the cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud cloud for the glory of the Lord had filled the house. Do you want the glory? Are you tired of dead religion? Amen. See, there's more to life than us just making money. If you throw that chart up there, you may want to write down these five things that will attract God's glory as the musicians come. If you didn't get them all, that's holy living, prayer, worship, a sacrifice, and unity. Every one of those things were found right there in those two verses of Scripture. And if you will take those and if you will apply that to your life and ask the Lord, Lord, what does this mean in my life? Lord, how do I attract your glory? How do I have more of your presence? Lord, how do I personally do this thing. They were doing it together. Lord, help me to do my best when I get with the body of Christ to come together in unity, in love, and in faith. Help me, God, to be more like you, Lord Jesus. Help me to be filled with your glory. Amen. The temple was filled with the glory of God. The mystery which God had hidden for ages, Colossians 1.27, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Pass the knee. Let it rain. Let it rain. Open the floodgates of heaven. Let it rain, let it rain, open the floodgates of heaven, just sing it to him, let it rain, let it rain, open the floodgates of heaven, oh, let it let it rain, open the floodgates of heaven, mm -hmm. we feel the rain of your love, we feel the wind of your spirit, and now the heartbeat of heaven, let us hear, mm -hmm. we feel the rain of your love, we feel the wind of your spirit and now the heartbeat of heaven let us hear oh let it rain let it rain open the floodgates of heaven oh let it rain let it Your love. 
of your spirit now the heartbeat of heaven let us hear we feel the rain of your love we feel the wind of your spirit and now the heartbeat of heaven let us hear 